let me start by telling you what human genome means. The term human genome simply means all the chromosomes presenting in a human cell and all the genes present on the chromosomes. Every cell in our body contains a set of 23 pairs of chromosomes. Chromosomes are made up of DNA, and the basic unit of DNA is a base pair. So if you join all the 23 chromosomes, they add up to a total length of 300 million base pairs. So we say the human genome is 3,000 million base pairs long. So why do we study human genome? Simply because it contains the blueprint for making a human being from conception, growth, development, reproduction, aging, and death. The genes in our genomes decide most of our traits. Genes decide the color of our eye, color of our hair, our height, our weight, and so on. More importantly, mutations in these genes can cause many genetic diseases, like several types of cancers, thalassemia, muscular dystrophy, Parkinson's disease, and so on. Even simple dis common diseases like diabetes, hypertension, allergy, and uh, arthritis, they are caused by an interaction of our genes with environment. In addition to making us susceptible to these diseases, our genes also decide how we respond to drugs. A drug prescribed for a specific disease may be effective in some people, but it has no effect in some others. And some others, it may even have an adverse effect. This is largely because of the variation in our genome sequence. So to understand the origin of the diseases, mechanisms of the diseases, and then to come out with effective treatments, we need to understand the human genome thoroughly. I would even go further and say, our horoscope is actually written in our genome. As soon as a child is born, you now even when the baby is conceived, its future is already embedded in its genome. So it's up to us to read it, understand it, and interpret it. To understand the human genome, the famous Human Genome Project was launched about 25 years ago. It's one of the largest projects ever attend attempted in biological sciences. Many people have compared it to the space program of NASA. It was initially conceived as a 15-year project with an estimated budget of about $3 billion. Thousands of scientists were involved or in several countries across the world, and the work started then is still continuing. This project had two simple objectives. One, to sequence the entire human genome, and two, to identify all the genes and other functional elements in the human genome. The first objective was accomplished in 2001 when we had two, not one, but two draft sequences of the human genome. It was published by two independent groups. And thereafter, there were many improvements to the genome assembly. And in 2003, we had a complete human genome, and it's known as the reference human genome, and it's on the public domain. Anybody can access it. So even though we have human genome sequence with us for more than 10 years, we are still far from accomplishing our second objective, that is to identify all the genes and other elements in the human genome. This is largely because at 3,000 million bases, human genome is relatively large and complex. This is how a stretch of human genome looks. It's just a long string of A, G, T, C, four characters, various combinations. This goes on and goes on up to 3,000 million characters. So for some of us, looking at new sequences that come out of the sequences is very exciting. When we go back to the lab every morning, we see what was generated the previous night, and we feel happy because it's something new. But the sequence itself doesn't tell you where the genes are or how they affect our health or diseases. So another problem with the human genome is the genes which make all the proteins in our body constitute less than 2% of our genome. These are the core elements of our genome, and they only account for less than 2% of our body. And in addition to genes, there are many other functional elements in our genome, like the sequences that regulate the genes, sequences required for the structure of the chromosomes, for replication of the chromosome, and so on. All these functional elements add up to about 10%. The rest, about 80% of our genome is made up of so-called junk DNA that has no known function. In fact, the amount of junk DNA in our genome is highly controversial. Some scientists have proposed that 80% of the human genome is functional. 
But some people like me, we say 80% of the human genome is junk. To support that argument, we point to some fishes and birds, which have a very small amount of junk in their DNA, but they still they live a normal life. They have a long life, and they do everything that we can do. On the other hand, there is a fish. It's a lungfish found in South Africa. It has about 10 times more junk than human beings. And nothing special about this fish. It doesn't have a bigger brain than us. It's not smarter than us, but it has 10 times more junk. So as such, the role of this junk DNA is not known, but take home messages, presence of that large amount of junk DNA makes it a challenge to look for genes in the human genome. Typically, genes are present in fragments, pieces, and because of this junk, they are scattered over a very large region in our genome. So it makes it difficult to pinpoint where the gene starts and ends. Different methods are being used to predict genes in the human genome, and many of them are complementary. The approach we took is called the comparative genomic approach. So in this approach, we sequence genomes of other animals and compare with the human genome. We can do this comparison because all animals are related and we have a common ancestor. For example, we shared a great-great-grandfather with uh, mice about 80 million years ago. We had a common ancestor with birds about 300 million years ago. We and sharks shared a common ancestor about 450 million years ago. In fact, we all share a set of genes known as the basic toolkit that is required for making an animal. So these genes are all present in all these animals. But of course, there are differences between these animals and in their genomes. Otherwise, we will all uh, look very similar. That would have been terrible. So by comparing the genomes, we are able to pinpoint what is common between all these animals and what is unique to each animal. The sequences that are common tell us what is responsible for the fundamental biological processes that are common to all the animals. The unique sequences tell us what makes a human a human, a chicken a chick. So this is how comparative genomics helps us to understand various genomes, including our own genome. So for comparative purpose, we actually introduced a new model genome of a fish. It's a very unusual approach we took. Of course, this was proposed by my mentor, uh, Nobel laureate Sidney Brenner. This was proposed even before the human genome was sequenced, even before we knew how many genes are there in the human genome. So this is the Japanese puffer fish. It's commonly known as fugu. I don't know how many of you have eaten. It's a highly toxic fish, but a delicacy in Japan. I have eaten it, and I'm still alive. So what is special about this fish? It has a very compact genome of only 400 million bases. And in fact, it has the smallest genome among all the vertebrates. So at 400 million bases, this genome is only one-eighth the size of the human genome. Of course, one might say it's a fish, it's a lowly creature, and it deserves to have only one-eighth of the DNA that we have, and we should have only one-eighth of the genes that we have. But by sequencing the whole genome of the fish, we showed that it contains a similar number of genes that we contain. And in fact, this fish, by some unknown mechanism, has managed to get rid of a lot of this junk DNA and kept its genome very streamlined. Overall, the junk content in this genome is only about 10%. So this reduction in the junk DNA and the search space for genes is a great advantage in predicting genes in the pufferfish genome. Typically, the pufferfish genes are small, and they're very closely packed with short intergenic regions that is uncluttered by this junk DNA. So by sequencing the pufferfish genome and comparing it with the human genome, our first contribution was we were able to identify about 1,000 new genes in the human genome that were missed by other methods. And the final count of genes, as you can see, pufferfish has about 19,300 genes, and we have 20,300 genes. So it's not a great difference between us and pufferfish. In fact, before the human genome was sequenced, it was thought, in fact, it was printed in textbooks that humans should contain at least 100,000 genes because we are more complex and we are more intelligent than other animals. But when the human genome was sequenced in 2001, the first thing that was surprising was humans had only about 20,000 plus genes. And in fact, all the vertebrates, like fishes, birds, frogs, sharks, they all have about 20,000 genes plus or minus, say, 1,000 genes. 
Then where does the complexity come in in humans? It's the way these genes are regulated, how they function in different situations. So that's the next challenge to understand how the genes are regulated. So as I said, all our cells contain the complete genome, and each cell contains 20,300 genes, but not all the genes are switched on in all the cells all the time. If that happens, that would be a disaster. So certain genes, known as the housekeeping genes, are turned on all the time. There are other genes which come on and go off at specific time during development in specific cells or in specific tissues. So it's overall a very complex pattern of expression, and this expression is regulated by elements called gene regulatory elements. Unfortunately, these elements are rather short, as you can see in the highlighted green part, and they're scattered all over the genome. So searching for them is literally like looking for a needle in a haystack. And to make things worse, in this case, the needle also looks like the hay. So even here, mutations in these elements can result in genetic diseases. These are cases of polydactyly, where children are born with more than five fingers. So this congenital condition happens because of mutation in a gene called sonic hedgehog. So in order to identify these mutations, first we need to know where the regulatory elements are, and that's the challenge. Here again, we showed that comparative genomics is a powerful approach. Here what we do is compare between different genomes and look for regions out, outside the genes and sequences that are highly conserved. Here you're seeing a comparison over a period of 400 million years of evolution. If some sequence is conserved over 400 million years of evolution, they are likely to have a function. Otherwise, they would have diverged and would have become unrecognizable. So we have recognized, identified thousands of such elements, and we have tested them in mice and in sometimes in fish, and shown that they do function as regulatory elements. So this is another contribution we have made by using a fish. A few years ago, actually, we patented a piece of DNA from the puffer fish. This is a very short sequence. What this element does is it can direct expression of genes specifically in T cells in humans. T cells and B cells are very important immune cells in our system. So this piece of DNA is a useful therapeutic tool for either delivering drugs or activating a gene in T cells to treat immune system related diseases. So this approach I've described just now is one of the approaches being used to study the human genome, to understand the human genome. Uh, and there are many approaches and the work is still going on. So in the near future, with a better understanding of the human genome, we will all be moving into the era of clinical genomics. That is, genomics will be used in clinics. Fortunately, over the last few years, there was a revolution in the DNA sequencing technology, and the cost of sequencing has come down dramatically. When the first human genome was sequenced, it cost about $300 million. Today, you can sequence a human genome for just $3,000. Very soon, we'll be able to sequence a human genome for just $1,000. So with that, whole genome sequencing will become a very common and routine diagnostic tools. Uh, currently in my lab, we are working on rare genetic diseases. Uh, by, as the name implies, these are rare diseases that happens sporadically in the population, in less than 1% of the population. What is uh, unique in this is all the other family members will be normal here parents, grandparents, siblings, but one child will have multiple symptoms like deformed limbs or uh, in, uh, inhibition of uh, immunity and so on. So such these symptoms are very difficult to diagnose and doctors take a long time to figure out what's happening. So here we help the pediatricians by sequencing the genes of the affected child, its unaffected parents, siblings if there are any, and then we try to pinpoint where are the mutations and which gene is affected. So this helps the clini clinicians to make an informed decision about the therapeutic regime that will be suitable specifically for the child. So these genomic tools are taking us into the next era of precision medicine. In precision medicine, the treatment and prevention of diseases will be based on individual variability in genes, in environment, and lifestyle of each person and the drug designed and prescribed will be specific to individuals. So this is going to be a very powerful way of treating diseases. And I'm very optimistic with this precision medicine. We'll all be able to live 
healthier and longer life. Thank you.